the chorus from an old hymn that many are probably familiar with. The chorus says or sings, Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I, want, I give you a chance to sing, Tiff, and you, you passed on it. So, many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. There are many things about the future we don't know. There are a number of things we do know, unless something you know, drastic would happen differently. But there are many things we don't know. There are many uncertainties in life. The title of this morning's message is Going Not Knowing. Ann said to me, don't you think you'd used that title before? I said, I probably have, because I, I like that phrase from uh, Hebrews. It's Hebrews chapter 11 and, and, and talking about Abraham going, God calling him to go forward. He didn't know where he was going, but he was uh, obedient to God, obedient to God's voice, going, not knowing. We go and we move forward each and every day in many areas of our life, not having all the answers, but as Christians, we know the God who does, and that's something we can always hold on to. We don't have all the answers, but we know the God who does, and we can be assured of that saying. Um, I don't like to use cliches a lot, but this, this one is definitely true. Where God guides, God provides. Where God guides, he provides. And so if God is guiding us, if God is leading us, he'll, he'll provide. Last weekend, uh, there was a lot in the news about the United Methodist Church. It happened kind of like on Friday and Saturday, and, and uh, I really didn't deal with it last week in church, but, you know, the New York Times and CNN and, and Fox News and the Washington Post and Times and USA Today and all the major news outlets had stories on the possible split in the denomination in the United Methodist Church. It's a, we're, we're the second largest denomination in the United States. Uh, worldwide, there are about 13 million members in the Uni United Methodist Church. And so there have been a lot of ongoing um, differences and dissension in the United Methodist Church for many years. But over the last several years, and especially this last year, it's, it seems like it's reached a, a boiling point and something is going to change. Last weekend, some of the news outlets reported things that wasn't really accurate. There was a proposal that was put out last fr a week ago Friday on January 3rd and it was it was titled I'm, I don't I'm never going to memorize this title because it's just a proposal but it's the protocol of reconciliation and grace through separation. That's that's kind of a fancy way of saying this is a way that we think the church can split in the best way possible, the most amiable way possible. And this, this, this proposal was, um, the mediator of this proposal was, I forget his name, I think it's, uh, he's attorney at Feinberg. He's the one that did the 9-11 compensation fund for the victims of the 9-11 compensation fund. And he's been known for, on a national level for um, the, those kind of things, mediations. And so he was one that volunteered his uh, time pro bono to help with this. It was a group of 16 United Methodist leaders from all different factions, from the, the very progressive group leaders to the conservative group leaders and in between, they, came, they got together basically privately, it wasn't anything official, and said, hey, let's try to come up with some, some way that we can do this in the, in the best possible way. Nothing is official until May of this year because that's our general conference. The delegates at General Conference, there are 862 delegates representing Methodists all over the world. The delegates make these decisions. Whatever they decide, that's what um, will happen for the denomination. So as of now, we don't know what's going to happen. Most likely, it is very likely, there is going to be a, a split in the denomination. How that all works out and how it um, comes down on a, a local level, we don't know. It's, it's going, not knowing. We as a church, hopefully everybody feels this way, we need to keep going, keep moving forward in ministry and mission and outreach and serving the Lord to fulfill our mission because really whatever happens with that, it, it won't really impact our ministry in any 
major way, and we don't know exactly now what is going to happen. Many things about tomorrow we don't seem to understand, but we know who holds tomorrow and we know who holds our hand. Where God guides, God provides. The last few days, we've had a, a number of changes in our household because with my mom um, living with us and then with her situation and then um, really they needed her to have, because of the chemotherapy, a, a designated bathroom and we're very grateful to Bob Woods and all the work he's done at the Parsonage and here at the church as well. And, but we've, we've kind of shifted things around. And we've had several bookshelves in our house. Well, it ended up in, in my office at home. There are boxes of books and piles of books. So I was trying to put some away the other day. And I came across uh, these two books. Well, I was just putting books back on a bookshelf. This one is called, it's called, And Are We Yet Alive? It was by Bishop um, Richard Wilkie. And, it's, and the subtitle was The Future of the United Methodist Church. And I, this was from 1986, okay? So this is over 30 years old. And in, inside the flap, when it talks about the book, it says, the United Methodist Church is, in, is a church in crisis. This was written in 1986. Since 1962, the church has been losing influence and membership at a dizzying rate. Signs of malaise are everywhere. Church school membership has been sliced in half. The number of church teachers and workers is off more than 100,000. More than 1 million people have abandoned the church just since 1973. Now, across this seemingly dismal landscape comes the powerful, hope-filled rallying cry of, and are we yet alive? Bishop Richard B. Wilkie asserts that there is a way to stop the precipitous decline of United Methodist growth and to get the church moving forward again. Just sharing that, this is what we're going through now is nothing new. It's been going on for at least 30 to 40 years, although it has reached, it has reached a boiling point. While I was putting these books away, I came across another book that, was, that, that I had, and it's titled United Methodist Renewal, What Will It Take? The idea of this book was that everybody knows there needs to be renewal in the church, but what's it going to take to, have, to see that happen? This book was from 1988, so again, over 30 years old. And he said, uh, Jim Heidinger, who was a former uh, president of Good News, he said, most every United Methodist would agree that we desperately need renewal. We would not all agree on the nature of the renewal we need. Since the early 1970s, I've, I've had the growing conviction that United Methodism was suffering from problems of a theological nature. If we were to recover vitality as a denomination, we would have to have serious reevaluation of the theology we are teaching and preaching. Yet for some reason, we have been reluctant to do that very thing. And then he says, will renewal come to the United Methodist Church? Again, this is in 1988, over 30 years ago. That's a question thousands of United Methodists struggle with these days. Our urgent need for church renewal has become unquestionably clear in recent years. Sagging statistics and low denominational morale shout at us so loudly we can no longer ignore them. So for over 30 years, many people have known we need renewal. It's just how do we go about it? And where does it come from? And what, what steps need to be taken? There's one other book that I had on my desk. Now, this is a newer book. This one is called A Firm Foundation. And actually, we're going to use this book this year for Lent as the Lenten study on, on Wednesday nights. And the subtitle of this book is Hope and Vision for a Methodist Future. And I'd just like to read two quotes out of this book. This is, again, just recent from a, a year or two ago. This is a time of great uncertainty for many in the United Methodist Church. Currently, our church is in a time of open schism and crisis. Many wonder, what will the future look like? Will the conflicts that have sapped this church of its vitality continue to be waged? Will the church continue to grow older without connecting with the rising generation of, of younger people? Will we continue to be held captive and neglect the true mission of the gospel. So again, 30 years later, this book has come out, 
And one last quote I'd like to share with you. This is from John Wesley. So we had 30-some years ago, 30-some years ago, uh, a year or two ago. This is from John Wesley from 1786. So what's that? 230-some years ago. John Wesley said this. I'm not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist, either in Europe or America. But I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power. And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast both the doctrine, spirit, and discipline with which they first set out. So John Wesley, even over 200 years ago, saw that if we didn't hold on to, to the Lord and if, and if our, our ministries and our churches weren't founded in the truth of God's word and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's leading and serving, there, w- there would definitely be problems in the future. We don't know how this is all going to work out. I have a friend who's I've known for a long time in ministry. He's retired now. He's the head of the... Um, Wesley Covenant Association in our, our area. And he sent out a letter and said this, and I just like to, he said, we are all aware of the tension and debate that has been center stage in the UMC for decades. Ministry has suffered because of the time and resources demanded by diverse views on human sexuality and scriptural interpretation. The United Methodist Church is facing a potentially chaotic and convoluted general conference in May as separation seems inevitable. And he's just basically stating the, what, what everybody sees. And then he offers some suggestions. I'm not going to read all of his suggestions, but his, his last four suggestions are these. Commit a time of prayer for the future of the church. Open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Do not accept the ploy that this separation is solely about gay marriage and ordination. The LGBTQI issue is the presenting issue and not the true problem. Scriptural integrity and authority remain the crucial issue. Process the reality that every minister will make a choice as well as each church regarding whether to stay in the UMC or join a new movement of God. And then the last one is, every minister is called to explain the options and shepherd their people through the decision-making process. This Wednesday at 6.30, usually Bible study is 6.30 to 7.30. We may go a little longer on Wednesday depending on uh, the the conversation and who's all there and the questions and and discussion. But we'll we'll, we'll look at these things in, in more detail There's also a lot of information on the United Methodist News site, and if you would like more information and resources, you can just ask me. To me, it's essential that we we are people of prayer, not only for our church, but for the the denomination and what's going on, and that we stand, we have our feet on on solid ground, not on on, on sinking sand, but on solid ground of the word of God and and his truth. And so um, please be in prayer for this, and, and may we all... Remember that many things about tomorrow we don't seem to understand, but we know who holds tomorrow, and we know who holds our hand. If you look at the scripture that's in the bulletin today from Hebrews 11, this, we read in Hebrews 11 that Hall of Fame, uh, 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 that chapter, the Hall of Fame of Faith. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. We don't know everything about the future, but we know the one who does. This is what the ancients were commended for. And we read in in Hebrews 11 about many uh, of the saints of old, but starting in verse 8, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Going, not knowing. Abraham knew God called him. He heard the voice of God. God spoke to him audibly. We may not have the voice of God in that way, but we do have the voice of God through his word. God speaks to us. God leads us. God God guides us. Abraham went, even though he did not know where he was going, by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. 
For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He had his eyes on the prize, his eye, the eyes on a heavenly home, heavenly calling. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who made the promise. I say many times that God is faithful to his promises. Many times at the end of a funeral service, when, when we're at the cemetery, and, and I, I'll say a prayer at the cemetery, and, and usually in that prayer I say something like, thank you, God, that you are faithful to your promises. And that's, those aren't empty words. God is faithful to his promises. And so we read, from this one man as good as dead came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. There's another scripture that says God does exceedingly abundantly more than all we ask or imagine. We may not be able to see it, but if God is behind it and God is calling and we are faithful to that call, God will do amazing things in our midst, in us and through us. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Verse 19, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. Abraham knew that God said that his offspring would be through Isaac. And he knew that God called him to sacrifice Isaac. He did not know that God was going to stop him before it actually happened. He didn't realize that it was a test from God. But Abraham, the Bible tells us, believed that even if he would have gone through with the sacrifice, that Isaac wouldn't have stayed dead, that God would have raised him back to life again. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Trust and obey. The hymn, that old hymn. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I believe God is calling us and, and, and his people to trust and obey. There's also uncertainty for us about the, the center for hope. But again, many things about tomorrow we don't seem to understand, but we know who holds the future. We know who holds our hand. There are a lot of uncertainties, but these are such exciting times, and, and it really it's, wonderful, it's a wonderful and unprecedented opportunity for us as the Wintersville United Methodist Church for new and expanded ministry and mission and outreach and growth. There, there's amazing potential. In, in the nearly 200 year history of this congregation, there has never been a, a tool for ministry and mission like this. We have never had this type of potential in moving forward into the future. I know there's been some concern and, and I, I've, I, I've been asked, you know, what's, it seems like we're, we're in the dark or who's making these decisions and, and, and why, why, aren't, why aren't more people involved in the decision-making process? Just so you know, and, and please share this with those who aren't here today, very few decisions have been made. Now, that may be good, that may be bad, but very few decisions have been made. As a congregation, numerous times, everyone was invited to the meetings, everyone was invited to the discussions, everyone was invited to the, when we had votes. And as a congregation, we overwhelmingly approved that we wanted to move forward with the Center for Hope. There really haven't been many decisions made since then. It was decided that the, we know who the construction company is, we know who the architect is, and it was decided, let them pick out all the colors and the floor and the trim and, and all that stuff. I had visited a church in Weirton that it was having an opening a couple years ago, and I went to their grand opening just to see what it was like. And while I was getting the tour, the, the, the lady that was showing me around said, oh, you know, um, well, the sanctuary was all black. And again, they explained that. And, but then the, the rooms, and they were all kinds of different colors. And I never asked because I, I, personally, I don't really care about that stuff. So, and so I, she said to me, though, you know what? We decided to have our pastor's wife pick all, all the colors in the whole, whole building and all the decorations. 
No. Anyone would probably like that. But, and I, I just looked at her and I said, really? And, I, and uh, she said, yeah, that's what. And I just was thinking to myself, I didn't say it. I thought, you know, I don't know that that was the way to go. But um, I don't know the pastor's wife. I just was, we thought if we have, you know, if we have 300 people active in our church and we were talking about colors and trim and flooring and all that, there'd probably be at least 100 different opinions. And then people get mad because it's not their way. So it's let the experts decide. Let the, build, the architect, let the construction company. They deal with this stuff all the time. And as long as they don't do anything crazy, which we knew they wouldn't, let them decide. So the only other decisions that I know that have been made so far, the, the kitchen equipment, it's a brand new kitchen over there. And folks from the construction company met with our United Methodist women and, and those that use the kitchen a lot. And I wasn't there, but I think there were 10 or 12 or 15 ladies there. And I don't know if there were any men. So, you know, if I, that, I wasn't there. And they talked about it. And they said, what do you want to see the kitchen be able to do and all this stuff? And they, they, they had that advice. And the only other decision that I know that's been made is chairs for the new building. And at a trustee meeting or council meeting, or there was a team of about 10 or 12 people and, they, and, and someone really put a lot of time into researching the different chair options. And we wanted, you know, something quality and a good price and a, a color that would blend in. And I was at that meeting. I didn't say a word. Uh, those of you there can attest that. I did not say a word. And then finally, some, somebody said to me, what do you think? And I said, I don't care. <laughs> I said, I don't care what color it is. They said about the color. I, said, I don't care. I couldn't even tell you what every color our, our rooms are in our house I, right now. I don't, I don't that stuff, I, that's just not my thing. And so I said, just so it's not anything crazy. And I said, there's a group of people here that are, you know, they, again, they wanted quality chairs that would, that would work out well, that would, that would blend in and, and wouldn't be an eyesore. So other than that, no certain rooms have been decided, nothing else. So on Saturday, the January 25th, there won't be any official decisions made that day because for us as part of this church, the way our decision making works is our administrative council, which has about 50 people on it and anyone can come to the meetings. The administrative council is the decision making body for the church on most areas. There are a few, a few areas where it's not, but for most areas. And so on January 25th, it's a leadership planning day. It's just talking about our future and maybe doing some prioritizing and looking at things and, and just kind of brainstorming so we have a, so everyone has a chance to give input and, and, and a feel for how we're moving forward into the future. We have a team that's working on planning for the celebration weekend. That's not something that, you know, you can have a group of 50 or 100 people do. We have a team that's working on planning for that. You know, any ideas are welcome for that as well. Many things about tomorrow we don't seem to understand, but we know who holds the future and we know who holds our hand. From the beginning of time, from the beginning of creation, the creation of human beings, there's been uncertainty about the future. When Moses, near the end of Moses' life, when Moses was basically, God had called Joshua to, to, to to take over as a leader for his people from Moses. We read in Deuteronomy 31, and Deuteronomy 31.8 was the, the scripture passage that I clung to when we were going through all the difficult times with David many years ago. You know, we didn't know how that was going to turn out, but we knew, that we, we knew that God was with us, and we trusted God in his promises, and we knew that even if it did not go at all the way we wanted it to, that that God would be there for us and he would be there for David and, and, and it, would, it would be okay in the end. Deuteronomy 31 says, Then Moses went out and spoke these words to all Israel. I am now 120 years old and I am no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, You shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. Where God guides, God provides. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. Joshua also will cross over ahead of you as the Lord said. And then verse 6. Be strong and courageous. 
Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, because of the enemies, because of the battles. I think it also applies more generally because of the unknown future, because of the obstacles, because of uncertainties in life. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or never forsake you. These words were spoken, what, three, almost 4,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago, something like that, and they, they are just as true today. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, be strong and courageous. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. There's much we don't know. I believe it's so important that we focus on what we do know. To me, it's foundational that God loves all people, that God wants what is best for all people. God knows what is best for all people, and God primarily reveals that to us in his word. And if he reveals it to us in any other way, it never contradicts the word of God. God loves all, God knows what's best, God wants what's best, and God can be trusted. There's, a, there's another short chorus that's in our hymnals that many of you know. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon God's word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of our ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you that you can be trusted. We thank you that you are King of kings and Lord of lords that you are the ruler, the eternal ruler, Lord, of all that is. Lord, we know we live in a fallen world. We live in a, a broken world. The evidences are all around us. We also know, Lord, that we can live in a redeemed world. And in the midst of all the brokenness, you can put pieces back together. In the midst of all the brokenness, you have called us to be your hands and your feet of grace and mercy and love and renewal in this world. Lord, you have called us to be salt. You've called us to be light in society. Lord, you have called us to move forward and onward and upward in Christ and with Christ and for your kingdom. Lord, there are many uncertainties in our denomination. There are uncertainties here in our own church and with the Center for Hope. We pray that you would help us to trust in you, to build on the rock-solid foundation. We pray that the decisions that are made are made for your glory and expanded in new ministry, mission, and outreach, that we would truly be that beacon of Christian love and compassion and hope that you've called us to be. Lord, we pray for our denomination and whatever happens, we pray that you would work it for good and that ministry would be even increased and expanded, that lives would be impacted by the good news of salvation and life in Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you are our eternal hope. We thank you that you are faithful to your promises and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.